hypertension, about 90% of the cases have no specific cause, as opposed to secondary hypertension, which have a lot of uh, condition that can increase the risk of that, such as one example, again, per se, with the kidney diseases. Or what other example you talked about? Endocrine. Renal failure. Renal failure. Endocrine. Adrenal. Adrenal tumors, a few chromocytoma, endocrine, the ish. Thyroid problem, all of these predispose to uh, secondary hypertension. Ocular bulging. <laughs> Ocular bulging. Yeah, mumkin ziat blood pressure can lead to that, yes. What are the uh, it's a multifactorial disease? What are the different factors that can increase our risk of developing hypertension? You have genetic factors, and it runs in families. So if your father have it, you are more, more likely, it's not 100%, but you are more likely to develop this condition in addition to environmental factors. What environmental factors can? Smoking. 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 Food, they is high salt diet, high lipid diet, in, uh, sedentary lifestyle, all these increase your risk and obesity as well. And also stress. Stress can increase what? Cortisone level, adrenaline level, and this can increase stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, which also can lead to elevation of the blood pressure. Hello, why did we talk about smoking? How does smoking affect the blood pressure, do you think? Increases viscosity of the blood too. Okay, but it's going to increase the heart rate. Excellent. Yeah, how does it do so? Yes. Nicotine? Nicotine. Yes. Nicotine is the right answer. Should come on. Damage the endothelium. And the most important part of uh, smoking that has relation to the cardiovascular system which is the nicotinic receptor. Where are the nicotinic receptors? Ganglia, excellent. Which is the ganglia. So which kind of ganglia? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Both. Where are the nicotinic receptors? On the muscle cells. On the muscle. So these are the two places where we have nicotinic receptors. We have them present in the autonomic ganglia, both for the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. In addition to that, in the musculoskeletal junction. Since it's present in both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, why is it raising the blood pressure? Excellent, because only the sympathetic nervous system controls the uh, blood pressure or the vasoactive tone of the blood vessel. Why is that, you remember? Parasympathetic lemma with hakkam in blood vessels. Myelo innervation, excellent. Another important thing I want you to remember the receptors for the parasympathetic nervous system are present on the vasculature. Show me the receptors, Mojdin. Alpha 1, Alpha 1, or Beta 2. Cholinergic. Adol adrenergic. Para, parasympathetic. M3. M3. So we have the muscarinic receptors, they are present. And endothelial cells and vascular smooth muscle cells. So if we activate them, we will see. A, uh, an effect of them. Should affect down time muscarinic receptors on endothelial cells. You know dilation. Dilation. On endothelial cells. Dilation, how do they do so? Uh, and Excellent. They activate uh, nitric, oxide. nitric oxide synthase to produce arginine gets converted to nitric oxide through an enzyme called ENOS or endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And we remember nitric oxide is going to diffuse immediately to the vascular smooth muscle cell and cause dilation. لو ما كان عندي endothelial cells, لو ما يصير عندي endothelial dysfunction or endothelial damage, yes, I will see the effect on vascular smooth muscle cells and it will be constriction. But we don't have the innervation, so acetylcholine will not be released from nerve ending to stimulate the blood vessel. That's why they are mainly under sympathetic nervous system control. But if I use a drug that is uh, affecting the muscarinic receptor, I will see an effect على in vasculature, okay? Remember these uh, things that you learned in the autonomic nervous system. So because blood vessels are under sympathetic nervous system control, if I target the nicotinic receptors by activating them, I will see the effect of the sympathetic nervous system at vasculature, which is gonna cause mainly constriction through alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. That's why we have elevation of blood pressure. 
When we have chronic treatment or chronic use of tobacco or nicotine, nicotine, if I'm talking about regular smoking, it's going to be um, tobacco, you feel nicotine, you feel other agents that are going to cause metaplasia, they're going to increase the risk for development of lung cancer. Even the vape smokers, they're consuming nicotine, so it's, only bad, it's also bad for them when they take this nicotine uh, because it's going to increase the risk of developing of different cardiovascular diseases through activation of the sympathetic nervous system. The effect is mainly on the ganglia. Uh, because we have the nicotinic receptor in the autonomic nervous system. And nicotinic receptors are present only in the ganglia. In the ganglia, if I take nicotine, I'm going to affect all of the symptoms, sympathetic or parasympathetic. Which effect I'm going to see is the dominant tone. A cool organ, every organ in our body is innervated by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So how do I decide which effect I'm going to see? It's depending on the tone in that organ. Hala, in blood vessels, the topic of our lecture today, are under sympathetic nervous system alone. That's why I'm going to only see the effect of the sympathetic nervous system. Other organs, we're going to see the effect of both. But which uh, effect will be represented clinically? It depends on the tone. Which is more dominant, the sympathetic for that organ or the parasympathetic for that organ? Yes, the blood vessels are the sympathetic. The heart is both sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So which decides the tone? Dominant. Dominant tone. Is it mainly under sympathetic or parasympathetic? And this is how we decide uh, what is the effect of these drugs that either activate the ganglia or block the ganglia. And we'll talk a little bit in the end towards about ganglionic blocking agent. You learned about these last year, Dr. Hamza. Okay. Okay. Um, so, how does a hypertension present for us? When, when the patient comes to your clinic, well, what's the main complaint? Usually they don't have a complaint. You, you find it by coincidence. That's why it's called the silent disease. So most of the time, it is asymptomatic. Sometimes it represents as headache. So a lot of people that have headache uh, when they have hypertension, uh, but sometimes this headache is misled. Yani the patient does not interpret it as hypertension because of many causes that can cause headache in our daily life and stressful life that people live. They have headache all of the time. So sometimes they don't really uh, or associate that with a main pathology such as hypertension. Another thing with hypertension, sometimes it is uh, diagnosed uh, by coincidence. Because we have a lot of blood pressure monitors in our houses, in our households, because they're becoming more cheaper, they're becoming digital, so it's easy to record the blood pressure. Hello, my father have one, maybe your grandfather have one, maybe your father have one. So you would measure your blood pressure just out of curiosity. So some people, they diagnose themselves by coincidence through using these uh, house machines. Another problem with hypertension is sometimes you will have a measurement of high blood pressure that is a false measurement. So you have high blood pressure, but you are not hypertensive. When does this happen? There is a condition called white coat hypertension. Does anybody hear of that? Well, what is this condition? Uh, when the patient sees the doctor wearing the white coat, uh, he will get stressed, and then uh, he'll have heart pressure. Yes, excellent. So white coat hypertension is caused because of stress. What will stress cause in our body? Adrenaline release. Adrenaline, as you know, or epinephrine, will cause activation of the sympathetic nervous system, increase in the heart rate, will increase the blood pressure, increases the constriction of the alpha adrenergic receptor, elevate the blood pressure. That's why if I go to the clinic now and I measure my blood pressure and it is 150 over 100, let's say, would that be a diagnosis for me that I have hypertension? No. How do we diagnose a patient of having hypertension? Uh, single readings usually are not enough, uh, not continuous readings. Excellent. 
So how many do you think we need? Two, two at least, two at least, I think. Two over 12 hours for one day is not enough. You have to have two during the day. Excellent. So at least one in the morning, one in the afternoon, at least for seven days. Hala, when you go to the clinics, you have a patient. He came to you. As I said, he have a high reading. You give him a table and you tell him, please buy a blood pressure monitor or you prescribe it for him. You tell him, come back to me in a week. Take the reading of your blood pressure in the morning and in the evening. And after that, if yet still I have persistent high reading, I will diagnose this patient as having hypertension. Why is why do I do one in the morning and one in the evening, you think? Cortisol level. Cortisol level. So usually the blood pressure gets elevated in the morning. We have this circadian variation of the blood pressure. So we have an elevation when we wake up. This is associated or coinciding with the surge in cortisol level. Where, uh, which can also increase our blood pressure. So we talked about what's the normal. We said the normal is below 120 over 80. If I have something in between 120 and 140, again, a hypertensive is above 140. Something in between is considered pre-hypertensive. And for hypertension, I have two different stages, stage one and stage two. Uh, stage two is above 160. Uh, I just want to re-emphasize on one point. I told you if I go to the hospital now and my reading is 150, the, pay, the doctor will not prescribe an antihypertensive uh, drug for me immediately, but she will wait to confirm. But if I have a patient who has very high reading, this is dangerous because this poses a risk of a uh, cardiovascular accident such as a stroke or heart infarction. No, in this case, I have to take control and manage this high blood pressure. But if it's in the stage one reading, we wait to confirm after one week and then we decide the proper treatment for the, drug, the patient. Now we talked a little bit about uh, the, uh, what are the factors that increase the susceptibility to hypertension. Other factors in the ethnic background. Studies have shown that people who are uh, blacks, or I study this study here on this slide is done in the United States, so African Americans, they have higher prevalence of hypertension as uh, compared to white Americans. Another thing that this study, this study done, it looked at the patients in the ages between 35 and 45. So we noted that women have less prevalence of hypertension uh, as compared to men. Why do you think is that? Estrogen hormones. Uh, estrogen. Well, what about estrogen? What do you know about estrogen? Relax, uh, relax. Yes, it's a vasodilator. It relaxes vascular smooth muscle. So estrogen is a cardioprotective hormone that women have this advantage over men. So women before which age are protected before menopause? Because after menopause, estrogen levels decreases, so women lose this protection. So if you look at the study, it's done until the age of 45, and this is before menopause. So once women uh, have lower levels of estrogen, they lose the protection, and the numbers become more equal for men and women. Now what's the problem? Why am I worried that my patient have a high blood pressure if it is a silent disease, it is asymptomatic? What problem arises from having chronic hypertension? Pathogenesis development. So what kind of things happen in our body? And now this can lead to cardiovascular events such as stroke because it causes changes, structural changes in the heart, in the blood vessels, and these Example of these changes, we have decrease in the blood vessel diameter, as you can see here. We have hyperplasia of the vascular smooth muscle cell. We have hyperplasia of the cardiac muscles. It can lead to heart hypertrophy. Because of that, it can lead to heart failure. So complicated or malignant hypertension will lead to end organ damage. What organs will be affected in addition to the cardiovascular? We have the kidneys. So it can cause renal failure. In the brain, we can have stroke. We said in the heart, we can have 
predisposition to heart failure, but also high blood pressure can put the risk of uh, myocardial infarction or a heart attack. In the eye also, it's going to cause changes in the retina, which can also uh, cause to papilledema, as you can see in this picture. So it's very imperative to diagnose and treat hypertension early on. Now we said what kind of treatment we have. We can do pharmacological treatment, and this is the topic of our lecture today, but also we can do lifestyle modification. What kind of lifestyle modification can we do? Salt. Salt. Also decreasing LDL lipids, so low cholesterol diet. Stop smoking. Stop smoking, excellent. Exercise more. Try to be stressful, uh, stress free. <laughs> <laughs> we are already stressful. <laughs> so, we, we can do alteration in diet and exercise. Also, environmental factors. We said smoking, uh, less stress. If we can do that, that would be awesome. And if that doesn't work, when do we do that? If we have pre-hypertension or early stages of hypertension, we have to start with certain drugs. So we're going to talk about the mechanism of action of all the drugs at first. What kind of drugs do we have? We have a lot of drugs. So we have diuretics, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers. And autonomic nervous system. So we're going to talk about adrenergic uh, alpha-1 sorry, blockers, uh, central alpha-2 agonists, and uh, adrenergic neuronal blocking agents, and finally vasodilators. Shufiya Shaba, please. Uh, how do I choose which one? I, at the end, when I explain all the drugs, how they work, we're going to give it algorithm. What do we do at first? If something comes up, what do we do? But usually, the treatment is tailored according to the diagnostic exam. Is it an uncomplicated or complicated disease? What's the ethnic background? We said, uh, for example, hypertension is more uh, prevalent in Africans. Okay. Why is that? What kind of hypertension they have? They have a special kind of hypertension called low renin hypertension. So the treatment for low renin hypertension is different than that of high renin hypertension. So, according to the pregnancy status, according to the severity of hypertension, as I told you, if I have mild hypertension or prehypertension, it's okay to leave the patient under a mild treatment and wait. If I have a severe form of hypertension, no, I have to intervene with multiple drugs to, able to, to be able to control that condition. Drug interactions, and we're going to be mentioning about how the different uh, antihypertensive drug interact with each other, and this is different than about than other drug interaction. Yani, one can drug interaction happen within the same disease, so different antihypertensive drug can interact with each other. Maybe there is an example about two drugs we mentioned here. Calcium blockers. Excellent. Calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. We said it's not preferable. It's not a complete contraindication. It's very important to know that. Certain cases we have to give them, but it's not preferable to combine two drugs that have inotropic and AV block activities together, especially in patients who have problems in their heart because this can uh, increase the risk of developing, if I'm talking about decrease in the contractility in the heart failure patient, a negative inotropic effect is going to be problematic for a heart failure patient. If I'm talking about conduction, it's going to be problematic for an arrhythmia patient. So we don't prefer to have this combination. And finally, patient compliance. What do I mean by patient compliance? Sometimes a polypharmacy is bad for elderly patients. So if a patient has to take five or six pills, he will forget some of them. So this, is, this poses the risk for um, incidents, uh, hospitalization, drug interaction. Uh, so it's preferable if I use a drug that will target multiple diseases in those elderly patients. Yes. The hypertension totally any uh, treated? It can be totally treated? Or? It can, but a lot of time it's uh, uncontrolled yeah, because of different things. Uh, so we want to try to maintain blood pressure below 140. This is our aim of treatment, and we can do that. 
If one drug doesn't work, we have to switch to another drug or an add, add another drug. But it's not going to be, yeah, he, it's not, he's not going to live without the drug. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. management. Yeah, it is a management, yes. Yeah. But uh, that was your question about management. And if we, we're not going to use a drug for some time. And in uh, the early stages, is I'm in the early stages of pre-hypertension, sometimes lifestyle modification if the patient will exercise more and eat healthy, yeah, it can be prevented. Okay? The patient company is not going to do it for example, if I give a calcium channel blocker or beta blocker, if I have arrhythmia or angina or hypertension? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. This is what we mean. And also, um, patient compliance. I choose, for example, I have an elderly patient who forgets a lot. I choose a drug that's prescribed once a day instead of using a drug that he has to take three times a day, because he would be more likely to remember taking it once a day than he would, even for us, if you take a drug three times a day, you will miss the dose during the day because you're at work or you're traveling or something like that. So this is also another thing on how we choose the drugs. Embellish with the first group of, uh, now let's talk about uh, the ways to lower the blood pressure in general. We said, um, Blood pressure is controlled by cardiac output and peripheral vascular resistance. So we, we lower cardiac output. So reducing cardiac output is one treatment modality. We do that by beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Or if we reduce peripheral vascular resistance with the use of vasodilators. Another thing we can do in order to reduce the plasma volume. We know if we have a higher volume of blood within a same size compartment of that blood vessel, it's going to put more pressure on the walls of that blood vessel. So the use of diuretics is actually one of the first uh, treatment we try with our hypertensive patient. Now, the topic of diuretics will not be covered today because we're going to learn more about it with the urogenital system. We're going to talk about the general characteristics of diuretics today. We know Diuretics are drugs that interact with uh, certain transporters and proteins that regulate uh, certain ions exchange within the kidney tubule. You know, you know that we have, uh, you've learned about these in the part physiology or you're going to learn about it with urogenital? So we have these different transporters uh, that control the reabsorption of sodium and other electrolytes to maintain these important electrolytes in our body. But of course, we have to have a certain set or have to a certain balance. If something gets disrupted, sometimes I have excessive reabsorption of sodium. Excessive reabsorption of sodium comes with water. And this raises the blood pressure. So in order for me to lower that blood pressure, I want to get rid of sodium. So I use a drug that prevents the reabsorption of sodium. And we're going to talk about these drugs that works in different compartments or parts. For example, <coughs> proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, a loop of Hindley, and collecting duct. We're going to talk about aldosterone antagonists as well. All of these will interfere mainly with the sodium reabsorption, and thus water reabsorption. And what are the general characteristics of diuretics? First of all, let me tell you how they were discovered. Diuretics, a chemical uh, form of these agents, and it's a different chemical drug, but with the same characteristics, was used as an antibiotic. Uh, so they noted in the 1930s that they started using this antibiotic, that patients who used it, they reported they had to urinate more frequently. So they decided to use the side effect in the advantage of treatment of hypertension. So in 1950s, these two scientists implemented and refined the usage of diuretics for treatment of hypertension. <coughs> now what are the general properties of diuretics? They reduce the morbidity and mortality in patients with hypertension. They are the first line treatment. I want you to remember this. But for which kind of hypertension? For mild or moderate hypertension. So they can provide adequate treatment of blood pressure control in patients with mild and moderate primary hypertension. Sometimes, in cases of moderate hypertension, uh, if diuretics alone 
they do not provide sufficient control over the blood pressure, we add another agent for them. And we're going to talk about which agent as we go through the slides. They are most efficacious in low renin or volume expanded forms of hypertension. Uh, who remembers what renin is? Did you learn about the renin angiotensin system? Yes. Yes. So renin uh, is a hormone or enzyme. It's an enzyme, yeah. Uh, it converts, yes, it's an enzyme. It's a converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. And then what happens to angiotensin 1? It gets converted to angiotensin 2 through angiotensin converting enzyme. And then what does angiotensin 2 do? See? Excellent. It causes direct, it has direct effect on the blood vessel through working on a receptor called angiotensin receptor. It causes vasoconstriction and it causes increase in aldosterone secretion, which causes increase in the um, translocation of the transporter that causes reabsorption of sodium. So the net effect is going to cause increase in the reabsorption of sodium and water, which will cause elevation of the blood pressure. So the body, when we have this hypertension, the body tries to accommodate for that by decreasing the production of renin. Certain people, they have low renin hypertension where their body tries to accommodate for this hypertension by lowering renin level, while other patients, no, they have high <coughs> levels of renin. That resulted in elevation of the blood pressure. So we have two kinds of blood pressure, high renin and low renin. In patients who have low renin hypertension, usually these patients have hypervolemic form of hypertension or volume expanded form of hypertension. So treatment, because we have a lot of water, a lot of volume, of diuretics is preferable in these kind of patients. Another group of patients, uh, and which kind of patient can we depend on ethnicity? So African Americans, or people from Africa, they usually have this form of hypertension. So if I bring you a question in the exam, and I tell you uh, an African patient came to your clinic, and he has hypertension, you would probably remember that it is a low renin hypertension, or you would remember that African, they respond very well to the use of diuretics. Another group of patients that respond to that will elderly patients. So elderly patients also, they are characterized of having low renin hypertension. Now when uh, do I have problems with the use of diuretics? The use of diuretics can affect serum lipids. It can affect insulin levels or insulin sensitivity. So we have to be careful with diabetic patients. What do I mean I have to be careful? It's not a contraindication, but I have to keep monitoring or have frequent lab tests of the lipid profile and the uh, blood glucose level of blood glucose control in the diabetic patient if I prescribe diuretic for them. Uh, the effect on diabetes usually occurs on the long-term use of diuretics. But if I have a better option, I would, and if I have a patient who have lipid abnormality, I wouldn't go for a diuretic that will increase his lipids. Instead, I will go for another treatment, okay? And remember these things when choosing the proper treatment for my patient. Usually, these drugs require two weeks to become fully effective. What do I mean by that? Um, the diuretic effect is immediate. What do I mean by diuresis effect? In who were losing water or evacuating water, but the lowering of blood pressure effect takes two weeks. Initially, actually, these drugs cause an increase in the peripheral vascular resistance, and this is as a compensatory mechanism to the lowering of the blood volume. So the body tries to conserve the normal pressure, Nisbe ilocan normal, it was has, having before. So we have constriction of the blood vessels. Later on, we said they're gonna work on sodium. So we have more excretion of sodium. With prolonged excretion of sodium from the kidney, the level of sodiums in the, vas the, sodium in the vascular smooth muscle cells will also be reduced, and this accounts for the decreased contraction of the vasculature that's associated with the use of diuretics over a long term, you know, after two weeks. And another thing I want you to know about diuretics, there are different classes of diuretics. 
in relation to their mechanism of action, of course, of course, where they work, which transporter, which ion channel. In addition to that, with regards to their efficacy, so we have moderate efficacy, such as the thiazide group. We have uh, loop diuretics, and some of them high ceiling diuretics. What do I mean by high ceiling diuretic? They have excellent capability as diuretic agents. So according to the state of the patient, we decide which one we want to use. Another thing with regards to the effects they have in electrolyte levels, for example, potassium, and this is most important. Some of the diuretics cause hypokalemia, for example, thiazides, as opposed to a group of diuretics that don't cause excretion of potassium, and we call these group of diuretics potassium sparing diuretics. So if I have a patient that is predisposed to arrhythmias or have uh, heart failure, I don't want him to have hypokalemia because of my diuretic in addition to the conditions he have. So in this case, I use an agent that maintains normal levels of potassium, such as the potassium sparing diuretics. But at the same time, I want to keep measuring potassium level in these patients not to have hyperkalemia as well. So these are things that can be drawbacks with regard to the use of diuretics. Other things, a lot of patients when they have um, kidney diseases, especially if, for example, they have secondary hypertension due to kidney disease, or they have a complicated hypertension that resulted in damage to the kidney. How do we determine kidney failure or kidney function? Creatinine levels, levels right? So let's say I have a patient who has a creatinine level of two, so his kidney function is 30% or 40%. In this case, the kidney is supposed to work 100%, now it's working 40%. Yes? Because of GFR. Well, GFR is a measure also, but usually we depend on creatinine uh, more than we do for GFR. Uh, so what do I do? I have a kidney that's only 30 to 40% functioning, I want to use a drug that will work on that remaining 30%. So it's not to give, give me the same effect as, as it would have had if it was working on a kidney that is 100%. So I would get only 30% of the effect I would get in a normal patient. So we have to take that into consideration. Uh, that uh, they are not very effective to resolve hypertension under conditions of kidney failure. The explanation of one again, let me uh, read it here. Diuretics act to modulate electrolyte balance via effects on transporter or channels within the kidney. <coughs> Thus, the efficacy of the diuretics to modulate these transporter and channels within a damaged kidney will be diminished or compromised. That's why we wouldn't see much of an effect. It's not a contraindication, but you wouldn't see a lot of uh, blood pressure lowering capability of diuretics in patients who have <coughs> kidney disease. So if they're used for other conditions, for example, edema, congestive heart failure, I would see the uh, efficacy if I use one of the strongest diuretics, such as ceiling diuretics, when we have kidney dysfunction. And different kinds, we learn about them Inshallah, with your regenerative system in the second semester. Now we're going to talk about calcium channel blockers. We already talked about them, yes? Yes, this is what I try to explain. It doesn't make sense if you have low renin to have hypertension. It's the body response to the hypertension. So, uh, yes, yes, yes. And if you high renin, hypertension will be low renin. High renin hypertension, we found out, it's more prevalent in whites or Caucasians. And for studies done in the United States, I'm sure for Asians and other ethnic backgrounds, there are other studies. But if we compare Caucasians with Africans, and if people will say in our region, the MENA region, <coughs> And if we compare elderly to young, young adults usually have high renin hypertension as compared to elderly patients. White to African, usually African have low renin, and white have high renin. Yes? 
هو يعني if في عندك genetic factors genetic predisposition they can yes but usually it's less risk yeah it occurs more with the older ages because of the different environmental factors but there's genetic factors so it can happen <coughs> I needed, I needed a vasodilator. Should I tell me? I tell me beta blocker. They wanted to kill me. So in total, could I tell you? Nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin. Ah, I don't know. I'm trying to get dry now. Should I tell you? It's a better one. Yes. 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 It's going to have a different effect on potassium mainly, but some of them are so, going to also affect the magnesium levels. You're going to remember these, inshallah, when we talk about them separately. There's one called aldosterone antagonist, uh, spiralolactone. Spiralolactone is an aldosterone, it's a potassium sparing, so it's going to cause more potassium reabsorption, so it's going to cause hyperkinemia. So, with regards to calcium channel blockers, there are Shabab, please. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Calcium channel blockers, already we covered it, but we're going to re uh, implement it with a focus on hypertension. What do these drugs do? They block calcium injury. They can work either in the cardiac and the vascular smooth muscle cells. They lead to blocking calcium in cardiac smooth muscle cells. They dilate peripheral arterioles and reduce peripheral vascular resistance. Which ones are these? Lipids. Lipids. We're not going to go in the details. Homophy first generation, second generation, third generation. We're not going to go in the details of the differences between them. I want you to know the general mechanism of action. So because we know the general mechanism of action, we will guess the side effect. To me, Raja, my side effects of nifedipine. Hypertension. Hypertension. What will this cause? Reflux tachycardia. Reflux tachycardia. How do I manage reflux tachycardia? Well, they use a beta blocker. So one indication, we're going to talk about that with beta blocker. One indication for beta blocker is to treat, or we add it to people who have reflux tachycardia when they are using vasodilators. Not everybody have that. Some people still have a tolerance to this uh, reflux tachycardia. Some people don't. So the people that don't, we add the beta blocker for them. Um, it depends on the condition of the patient. We, we can give them beta blocker. Yes, it depends on the uh, yeah, what, which drug is indicated for that patient according to other pathologies that he has. So there are certain indi contraindications for beta blockers. We, we are not going to prescribe actually calcium channel blockers as the first choice. Again, okay, the first choice is diuretics, right? Yes. If they don't work, we're going to add something else that we're going to learn next lecture. Sure, how can we decrease the peripheral vascular resistance? We talked about amylodipine and nifedipine. They don't affect the heart. They mainly target L-type calcium channels that are in the vasculature, as opposed to what? The non dihydropyridine the example on yeah. the example is the We're going to talk about them as a group as well. We're not going to differentiate. One thing that's different between virapamine 
and the tyazine that's present here, they have weaker negative ionotropic effect than verapamine, but both of them decrease AV conduction and heart rate. So because they have negative ionotropic effect, we don't like to combine them with beta blockers, especially in patients who have heart failure. So they can cause heart failure in patients with borderline cardiac reserve, and the ejection fraction at home, 40, 30%. So we do not use them in patients who have left ventricular dysfunction, who have this borderline cardiac reserve. Show other side effects, Haki 2D. Again, I have hypertension, Haki 2D. Peripheral edema. Flushing. Peripheral edema. Peripheral edema. So these are mainly for the vasodilators. What, actually, they are for both. One important thing, uh, I don't know how much we went through in, in the last lectures, verapamil can also target the vascular smooth muscle cells and type channel, but it works more on the cardiac myocyte. So it's going to have both effects. The peripheral with the effects on the heart. Or by by Nama, while in the Philippine family they That's only work vascular. on the vasculature. Uh, so, if I bring you a question in the exam, all of the following are side effects of nifedipine, and I put these one, two, three, four, and five. This is a good question. Which one would be the except cardiac depression? Cardiac depression, because it's only for the ones that work in the heart. Edema also is a side effect. This is also because of pooling of the uh, veins of the venous vasculature. And we talked about constipation being a side effect because it affects calcium channels that are present in the smooth muscles of the intestine. Yes. No. Um, another thing I forgot to mention in the first uh, in the first class, the first section, and you would mind, no? But I'm always talking to dental students. Uh, one important side effect associated with nifedipine is causes gingival hyperplasia. So yeah, you can note that. I mean, sometimes you have a patient taking nifedipine, and he tells you he's complaining of who he would think it's an inflammation of the gingiva. Gingiva is a lithe. But it causes swelling. The exact mechanism is not known. But it is one of two drugs that can cause gingival hyperplasia. We will show the dental students because they will have this condition, they will see it, so it's very imperative for them to take very good medical history. So they wouldn't treat it as an inflammation, but rather so uh, ask the, consult his physician, maybe they can switch uh, the medication to resolve that problem. So remember this also as a side effect of nifedipine. So, what about drug interaction? The use of verapamil and diltiazine in combination with beta blocker could cause a marked bradycardia and cardiac conduction blockage. We said it's not an absolute contraindication, but we have to be careful, and if we have another alternative, we don't combine them. In addition to that, they also add to the inhibitory effect of digoxin on AV conduction, so combining them with digoxin is also not favorable or problematic. And a study called the ASCOT trial, ASCOT star, uh, stands for Anglo-Scandinavian uh, Clinical Outcome in the Treatment of Hypertension, something like that. So it's a study that compared the combination of different drugs on their ability to lower blood pressure in hypertensive patients. They noted that combination with the ACE inhibitor reduce cardiovascular events in hypertensive patients. Yeah, in calcium channel blockers can be combined with ACE inhibitors. And the study showed that it should cardiovascular events, manaha, stroke, or myocardial infarction. So sometimes it's good to combine them, but as we said, if we have uh, the ability to use less drug, it's preferable if we have control over the blood pressure. No, 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 no,
a hypertension in isolated systolic hypertension, cherry isolated systolic hypertension, only the systolic blood pressure is elevated, but not the diastolic blood pressure. You want to stop here? Next time, uh, very briefly, like we can.